Okay. So again, I'm Sunny. Um, I am the research assistant here with the Wolf Conservation Center. Um, my focus is on a lot of things. It's on the anthropogenic effects of um, humans and how we how those anthropogenic factors such as policy, culture, religion, all those things intersect with um, canid ecology, specifically coyotes and wolves. Um, give me just one moment. I need to double check that we are recording. Let's see here. So I'm going to stop share real quick just so I can double check. I did not hear the recording button. Okay, it looks like we are recording. Good. Okay, let me just double check this. Okay, it looks like we're all good. Okay, let me share again and we'll get started. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're going to talk about tonight um, the different cultural perspectives of the wolf. And now we are specifically talking about the red wolf because we are going to be focused on the southeastern United States, um, particularly in Alabama. We'll talk more about that in just a second. But we're going to be looking at the cultural perspectives of the wolf and the importance of that among different communities of people. And as we go through this, let's all remind ourselves that no community is a monolith. Everybody is different between communities and within communities. Um, so the things that we're going to be talking about tonight are dominant social paradigms, meaning they are the maybe most common or uh, most well known, but it doesn't mean they're absolute. Um, and as we talk about this, this is going to be within the context of something called socioecology or socioecological systems. Um, this is basically the study of the interactions and dynamics between human society and nature. Um, basically, how we perceive ourselves and each other how we interact with ourselves and each other, um, and why we view nature the way that we do, and how all of these forces kind of interact to create effects um, that change habitats, change landscapes, and change lifestyles. Um, here's just a depiction of what a socio-ecological system looks like. And here, just a moment, here you can see culture right there at the top. Um, culture and, and all of these different elements of the uh, socio-ecological system all act on one another. Um, nothing operates in a vacuum. That's why the way humans behave, human belief systems, human perspectives, that's why all of those things are so deeply important to conservation, because the way that people, people view themselves and other beings, um, such as the wolf, or um, different landscapes and the way that they engage with it, such as the wolf's habitat, uh, all of those things interact within the social system and then, I don't want to say leak because that's such a negative word, but um, extend out into the non-anthropogenic landscape, meaning the natural landscape. Um, so here, you know, we can see human society and all its elements and its dynamics affect how we think about each other and the world around us. And it's not just thinking in terms of, um, you know, um, uh, you know, opinions of a specific type of species or something like that. It's also how we um how we value things morally, whether we think something is deserving of protection or not. Um, it gets, it can be very superficial or it can be very deep. And this type of investigation has been around for a long time, although the term socioecology hasn't necessarily uh, itself been around for as long. Um, and here's just one example that I think is very interesting um, from the 1940s. I think this, yeah, this is 1943, where um, an official, I, I can't remember what agency this person was a part of or if they were a part of a university, but they were basically studying how wildlife valuation um, perspectives of wildlife and the concept of nature among different cultural groups changes the way 
they viewed conservation efforts and whether they'd be open to it. Um, now, albeit this was an extremely biased report um, and has a lot of very colorful language um, when it comes to different types of people. Um, however, it's still interesting to see that these things were being clearly investigated because they clearly play a part in how uh, different people will engage with systems of conservation. So as we think about this in terms of the socio-ecological system, when we're thinking about the red wolf, we want to kind of investigate what happened, what drove the red wolf to near extinction. Um, they've been around for thousands of years, so something had to change quite dramatically to wipe them out in just a couple hundred years. So let's start with the question, who or what is the wolf to the human? Well, to answer that question, we have to think about the way that we perceive nature, because that plays a huge part in how we perceive other life forms. Um, a very common, um, or excuse me, well-known Western European kind of perspectives on, on what the wolf, or excuse me, on what nature is, is that it's separate or to be in some way below or beneath the human, that the human is kind of the apex of life forms um, and that everything else is subject to um, our needs and our desires. And along with that, because those things are separate, you then have different perspectives on the, the beings that inhabit something called civilization versus something called wilderness. The wolf um, inhabits this thing called wilderness, the thing that cannot be controlled. And so for some people, again, a lot of emphasis on some, many, all these things, because nothing is absolute. So for some people, um, the wolf embodies our notions of fear, of vulnerability, of um, an imbalance of power, and all of these things as they relate um, to our status as the human being. And, and I think, in, in my opinion, because humans are apex predators, it makes a lot of sense that being faced with another apex predator would really deeply challenge our sense of self because we have to think about, you know, what place do we have in this web of life? Um, if we are not at the top or if we're not in the middle, then who are we in relation to these other be beings that we occupy space with? Um, so I just picked up this new book that I really enjoy. It's called Wolfish. Um, it came out this year. The author Erica Berry explores this question of who is the wolf? What is the wolf? And the, the author explores this question through the lens of kind of exploring why it embodies fear. And Barry says that because it's been so long that so many of us have lived apart from the wolf due to extermination campaigns that wiped out or almost wiped out the red wolf, um, we've had a really long time to allow these imagined perspectives of the wolf to kind of um, become deeply entrenched. So Barry quotes this historian, Erica Fudge, um, in, the, in the book Wolfish, saying, humans do not live with biological creatures as much as they live with beings constructed within human cultural frames. So we see these animals, we see these other beings through this imagined lens that's deeply influenced by culture, by politics, by economics, when you think of, you know, things like agriculture, all of those things, all of those things really I don't want to say warp because it's not always um, negative, but shape the way that we view other beings. And the wolf is a very interesting case because a lot of times it's villainized in some cultures, but in other cultures it's revered. And we'll get into that in just a second. Um, and so Barry basically argues that we have been kind of in this perpetual twilight hour. There's a French saying that uh, Barry points to, which is, which says between dog and wolf. My French is really bad, so I'm not even gonna try it in French. Um, but basically this means, this refers to the twilight hour, whether dusk or dawn, when it's really hard to tell, you know, if you see a wolf cross your path, you're out walking in the forest, it's really hard to tell whether that's a dog or whether that's a wolf, depending on where you are, depending how big the wolf is. But we don't need to get into all those details. Um, and the point of that is when you're seeing that being, what you're seeing is both influenced by your physical reality, you know, you standing there seeing it, 
versus your psychological reality. You could be imagining something completely different, this monstrous thing that's going to come after you when all the wolf is really doing is just walking and going to see his family, something like that. So we've been conceptually trapped in this twilight hour for centuries, really, um, of not having the wolf on the landscape as it once was. And so buying into all these crazy hysterical narratives about what the wolf is or what the wolf could do to us. Um, so how my question, our question really, is how do we get out of this twilight hour and remember who or what the wolf is to us in our different cultural contexts? So we're gonna be exploring that question um, in the Southeastern United States. And like I said, specifically in Alabama, we're gonna be looking at a couple of different perspectives. We're gonna be looking at indigenous American perspectives, very specifically the Cherokee and Muscogee. We're gonna be looking at the European American perspective. Um, yes, I acknowledge that there are many different types of Europeans that uh, colonized um, North America. However, when it comes to this specific topic, a lot of those viewpoints aligned. Um, uh, especially as we looked through the archives. So that's kind of what we're referring to. So that should probably in your mind be a European American hyphen, not just um, European plus American, um, this kind of merged identity. I hope that makes sense. And then we're looking at the African American cultural group as well, because all of them have very different perspectives and stories of the wolf. So um, our case study here was Alabama, as I mentioned. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the red wolf persisted in the southeastern United States, as you can see here, um, all throughout this area is its historical range. And it persisted in that area for thousands of years, for thousands and thousands of years. And then somehow, uh, upon colonization, they disappeared. Um, and so the question has to be, what was so dramatically different um, between the, the people that occupied the land with the wolf um, that the wolf ended up disappearing? And we can't say things like, oh, well, you know, agriculture. Agriculture clearly would be a point of contention. You can't really say that because indigenous people practice agriculture. Um, indigenous people hunted. So you can't really say it was competition between humans and wolves for deer. All of those things were already being done on the landscape for thousands of years. So there had to be something different about the people um, and the way they engaged with the land and the wolf that caused this dramatic uh, disappearance and very rapid disappearance of the wolf. Um, and note too that uh, the, the wolf and the indigenous people uh, there in Alabama over time did experience climatic changes. Um, and they persevered through that too. Um, it's characterized, I believe it's called the hypothermal when it went from the glacial period to the interglacial period when temperatures started to rise, had to move further inland. So there are lots of things that they have already lived through. Um, so those pointing to those things as reasons they might have disappeared doesn't really work unless you look at the people who occupied the space. So, um, so let's dive further into this. So we looked at a bunch of archival documents. We looked at newspapers. We looked at federal reports, um, all different types of things to reveal these different anthropogenic census records, different um, anthropogenic factors that were ultimate and proximate causes of red wolf extirpation in Alabama. Now, ultimate causes are the things that basically set the conditions that um, that lead to the proximate causes of extirpation. Proximate means immediate, so things like a decline in deer population or the loss of habitat, which a lot of people refer to. Oh, that's why the red wolf disappeared because it lost its habitat. Well, why did it lose its habitat? Let's look at the ultimate causes, the things that set the conditions for that um, in order to you know, tell the whole story of what happened. So. A couple of uh, the primary things were European and later European um, or Euro American conceptions of land use. Um, that was an ultimate cause. Um, and that being, you know, things like clearing trees for agriculture, or for homes, or things like that. Um, 
European and Euro-American economic framework, frameworks, again, lumber, cattle, monocrops, um, you know, capitalistic endeavors versus subsistence economies, things like that. And then the two that we're going to talk about here, um, we're only going to touch on systemic legislative action once as a result of anti-wolf paradigms. Um, you could argue that that could be a proximate cause um, because of the one we're going to be talking about, but let's just say it's ultimate and then anti-wolf paradigms are proximate and paradigms are basically worldviews. So let's walk through a couple of maps that help us to kind of shape these questions and then we'll get into the cultural perspectives. So this map here shows the kind of timeline at which lands were purchased um, in Alabama as a result of the genocide of indigenous people and the colonization thereafter. So it's important to note that colonists were in the area before 1809. However, Alabama gained its statehood in 1819. So that's when the floodgates really opened, which is why these two, 1819 to 1839, are relatively even in terms of the um, number of recent wolf sightings. Well, that's what I surmise at least. Um, it's interesting because the area that was colonized the earliest, the dotted areas, has the least number of wolf sightings, or recent wolf sightings rather, and recent being post-1900. Um, post so all of these areas were colonized first. In the blank areas is because um, in the source that I used to make this map, um, the year of the purchase was really difficult to, to read, so I didn't want to guess. Um, and what's also really interesting is that about half, and well actually I'm getting ahead of myself, so hold that thought really quick. Um, and let's move to the next one. Um, this is a little bit more detail on um, the kind of shaping of the landscape um, post statehood. Um, now, this is really interesting because it helps to show where the plantations were uh, and thus the mass agriculture um, in antebellum uh, slash colonial Alabama. Now, a lot of people think the Black Belt is just because of the rich Black soil that's in Alabama, where, sure, you can say that, but it's also um, originally referring to that being the area with the highest concentration of African slaves in the region, um, which indicates the highest concentration or the largest plantations in the area. Um, and I think that's really interesting because this is the area, this is kind of the cutoff area. Most of the sightings, most of the recent sightings are all north of that. And then uh, the last one that we have here is looking at the last remaining indigenous territory be before eight, the 1830 Indian Removal Act. And you can see that about half of the uh, recent sightings of wolves occur in the areas that still were held by, uh, I believe there it was the Cherokee, uh, the creek, which is the Mus Muscogee Creek, and I believe Chickasaw, or the Choctaw. Um, I might be wrong on that. I think Cherokee was up here, and this Muscogee Creek. Uh, I think this was Choctaw, and I think this was Chick Chickasaw. So um, that's really interesting, too. So you look at all these maps, and you're just one of the natural questions that comes up is why? You know, what the heck was going on besides the, the natural landscape? Um, because a lot of the area that had the richest soil, this was the southeastern uh, plains is the eco region, I believe that it's called. And then you've got the Piedmont and all those different regions. Um, you just what the natural question is why? What was going on between the different people occupying the state? What was going on with the activity there, the human activity there that shaped um, kind of the concentration of the different of the number of sightings? Um, throughout time of wolves. Basically, how long did the wolves last in these different areas and why did they last this long? Or why did they continue to travel um, in these different areas versus others? So in order to answer that question, again, we have to look at the people. So let's go and look at who the people were that were occupying these spaces. Um, so let's start with the indigenous North American uh, cultures here that we have. Um, we're going to start with the Salaki, which is the Cherokee, and the Muskogee, the Muskogee. Now, 
I want to be sensitive to the fact that I might not be pronouncing these wrong, but I do want to be respectful in noting that these are the names that um, these communities call themselves. Um, and these are the anglicized names that were assigned to them. So um, because I don't want to be rude and continuing to pronounce things wrong, I will uh, default to these in the future when I learn to pronounce them right, I will uh, go and default to the, the proper names. Um, so as in the case of the Europeans, indigenous perspectives of the wolf more generally, but the red wolf, again, because of the region that we're in, they vary. Um, nothing, again, no culture is monolithic. No one is 100% the same. Um, so let's look at these two different perspectives. Um, unfortunately, this video won't work. I don't think the audio is gonna work for you. Um, so I'll just relay some of the information that was portrayed there. Essentially what's going on is um, a couple of people who are part of the Cherokee Nation explain the significance of the red wolf in particular to their people. And something that I found really interesting is that they refer to the red wolf as the red grandfather. And we also see um, in some um, origin stories, uh, such as that of Kanati and Selu, that the wolf plays a really critical, very instrumental role in the creation of, you know, um, landscapes and species compositions on landscapes. Now, um, I could be slightly off on this. I don't know if Kanati and Selu were the very first people, but they are in the origin stories um, as the the um, the elder figures in those stories, um, human figures rather. And uh, based on a conversation that I had with an individual who identifies as Cherokee, I'm not sure if he would be comfortable with me sharing his name in this instance, so I won't do that. Um, but some present day Tsalagi people believe that nobody should ever kill a wolf except for extreme circumstances. So this is the beginning of kind of understanding um, what could potentially um, contribute to a likelihood of um, being willing to act in a way that is supportive of the wolf's presence on a landscape or in a way that is detrimental or harmful to the wolf um, sharing the landscape with you. And I want to give just a quick example of kind of a caveat, and we'll have this in probably each instance. So Again, going back to the idea or the fact rather that no culture is monolithic, um, we're gonna point to the example of Andy Ray. Andy Ray was a hunter and trapper that was contracted with the federal agency, the Bureau of Biological Survey. Um, Andy Ray was half Cherokee, which means that Andy potentially had the opportunity um, to be born into and thus practice the paradigms that respected the red wolf, but he did not. Um, and this is just an example of how people still have free will. <laughs> people will still vary based on their life histories and their interests and all those different things. Um, so you can't just say, oh, this person is Cher Cherokee, therefore they believe that. Um, and this is just one, ex one old example, but one example of that. Um, now let's go to the Muscogee people. Again, not 100% the same when it comes to their views on wolves, just like any other group of people. Um, for example, um, the Bureau of Ethnology uh, observed many different valuations of wolves, some of which allowed wolf killing, um, such as the use of their skins as adornment for display of social status. Um, on the other hand, some uh, Muscogee people, especially those in the wolf clan, would be far less likely to kill a wolf due to beliefs of its supernatural traits. And I want to give a caveat here when referring to the Bureau of Ethnology. That's something that, again, you have to take with a grain of salt. Um, you shouldn't always put too much faith in um, the interpretations of colonized cultures when that interpretation is given by the colonizer um, because you you know there are different motivations there in interpreting those things um, and you want to be able to like report everything accurately 
Um, so that's why you should always back things up with by speaking to an indigenous person or referring to indigenous literature. And that's what we're going to do here. So uh, this author here, I believe the last name is pronounced Fixico. Hopefully that's correct. Um, this book is really interesting and it touches on different valuations and perspectives of other beings. Um, and this author points to, again, um, clans as they relate to different non-human beings. And so uh, let's read this quote here. So the first Muskogee people became known as the wind clan and as the first ones to see certain animals and plants, they took the animals and plants names for the powers and strengths of the animals, the bear clan, tiger clan, alligator clan, deer clan, and so forth. The Muskogee people learned that they, like all living things that breathe the air called Hodali, were part of Ekuna. So we can pull a couple of things out of that. Um, this let's contrast it to the uh kind of worldview that I grew up in, although I don't uphold anymore, which is Christianity, which is places humans on this um on a different level than the other beings and you know gives us governance over those other animals rather than kind of being a peer. Um and also, the Muskogee people here view themselves as part of the earth alongside other uh, beings. But then also, you can see that there was a belief that um, taking the names of these animals for their clan would also imbue them with the powers and strength of those animals. And this author in particular is part of the fox clan and explains that when you are part of that clan, um, you inherit that other being, in this case, the fox, as the guardian spirit, um, you learn your survival and other instincts based off of that species. And then you do even personality traits you would inherit from that being. Um, and this is the same for wolf and bear. And, and the author says this is particular, uh, particularly strong, rather, particularly observable among clans that um, are four legged, which I thought was really interesting. So let's jump to the Europeans real quick. Um, again, remember, we're talking about European hyphen American. So the one kind of merged um, culture that kind of birthed into what we have today. Um, and we'll go into a, a German example really quickly. So Europeans brought a lot of really deeply embedded negative perceptions of wolves to the Americas. Um, and I like this depiction here because you can see where not only where they traveled physically, but also where they brought their values and their value systems with them. They didn't just travel in a vacuum and just, you know, uh, their bodies landed there with no like consciousness or anything like that. They brought a bunch of values, a bunch of perceptions, a bunch of political systems, religious beliefs. They brought all of that uh, everywhere they went and in many places forced them onto other people. Um, and that being said, because of the outsized cultural influence they held due to colonization processes like genocide and ethnocide, these views were integrated into non-European belief systems and worldviews such as the Africans who eventually became the African-Americans. And there are examples as well. Um, I think it's the Choctaw that adopted you know, agricultural systems that were uh, largely dependent on livestock, which brought with it certain perceptions or certain um, interactions with wolves. Now, it's important to note that not all views of wolves that come from Europe are bad. Um, some are actually very Positive is an interesting way to put this, but positive, um, such as the story of Romulus and Remus, um, which is a really famous story. Um, you know, the two boys who were raised by wolves, and I believe they went to form the Roman Empire, something like that. So there's this, this, this power and this reverence that's associated with um being raised by wolves in that in that particular example. But then you have negative perceptions, such as the berserker, I hope I spelled that right, and the vaguer which are depictions of the wolf, as we mentioned earlier, um, as this kind of monster that just inhabits the wilderness versus civilization. And one of the reasons that was so bad and had so much disdain is because being um, expelled from civilization into the wilderness was like 
the punishment of all punishments. Um, and it was something that nobody wanted to be associated with. And it became so toxic that the wolf, um, perceptions of the wolf became quite racialized, which is really weird, um, and actually lasted into colonization of North America. It started, um, I don't know if it only started here with um, Germanic uh, perceptions, um, but uh, it began being applied to Jews, um, began being applied to Romani people. And then when it came to the Americas, um, you can see it in language towards indigenous Americans and towards African-Americans, comparing them to savages and ravenous wolves and things like that. Um, yeah, so just to get a little bit deeper, I don't wanna get too deep into this because I still have a couple of uh, examples from African-Americans to go through. Um, and we don't want to get too negative. This is a good week. Um, but when life depended for the Germanic people at this time, depended on hunting and migration, people actually admired the wolf's power and cunning. Um, but once sedentism kind of became the way of life, you know, settling into a society or um, settling into civilization and notions of property started to arise, um, you know, accumulating all these different things, whether it be crops, whether it be other types of property, whether it be animals, domesticated animals, the wolf became, uh, as Peter Arns write in this book, um, uh, lycanthropy in German, Germanic literature, I think is, is was the titles on the previous slide. Uh, the wolf became, becomes a symbol of uncontrollable nature outside the space of dwelling. Um, and we know that the ability to control nature was a bit of an obsession. Um, a controlled landscapes was a bit of an obsession to the colonizers. Um, and that came out in the way they did agriculture, that came out in the way they did enslavement, um, enacted genocide, all that kind of stuff. Um, and that showed in Alabama. Um, and this is where we're gonna talk about the systemic legislative action, um, because as we saw in the socio-ecological system diagram from earlier, your culture influences your politics because within that lies your values. Um, it also uh, influences your economics and the way you engage with other people, all that kind of stuff. And so when Alabama became a state in 1819, they almost immediately passed a law that encouraged um, the killing and destroying of wolves and panthers. And they offered $3 for every six month old or younger wolf or panther killed and $5 for every wolf or panther killed over six month old. Um, and so you, again, you have to ask like, what is going on? <laughs> Why? Are they so angry? <laughs> Why don't you like the wolf so much that you would pass a law like this? And just as a note, this um, legislation was so effective that they actually had to repeal it at the very, I think it was the very next session or the very next year because it almost bankrupted the state um, because of everybody coming to get their bounty. Like that's how ravenous this um, policy was and, and the people who were acting on it. Another example, this is from the Bureau of Biological Survey, again, the federal agency, but they were stationed and active in Alabama. Um, this particular example, I think, is talking about the West, um, but it might be the next one, actually. But it shows the kind of values that were behind the actions of these different um, agencies. So let's read this. So state game departments are coming to cooperate more liberally with the Bureau in efforts to destroy these animals. Timber wolves, and I'm going down to this next section, timber wolves, coyotes, wildcats, and foxes all join in game destruction here. At this period, wolves and coyotes often appear to kill for no apparent reason other than for amusement or sheer lust of killing. And before I comment, let's read the next one. Starting up here, the problem of ridding the national forests and cattle ranges of the West of gray wolves was taken up by the biological survey at the request of and in cooperation with the Forest Service. Publications detailing wolf killing strategies were widely distributed to forest rangers, ranchmen, hunters, and trappers in the wolf infested regions. 
their absolute and final extermination will probably not be practicable so long as extensive tracts of wild land remain to afford them harborage. This was one of many, many, many times um, that the chief of, Be chief of the Bureau of Biological Survey explicitly stated, we want to wipe them out. We don't want them here um, and show this valuation of livestock and really almost any other life form above that of the wolf. And they created this huge hysteria about they're going to wipe out the deer and they're going to eat our children and on all this stuff. Um, it was actually kind of crazy. Um, it's, it's wild to read through some of the things that they say. And you can see that it is deeply pathological. This is not based on any sort of scientific basis um, to claim that wolves and coyotes just kill for fun. Um, that is a really extreme form of anthropomorphizing um, and kind of projecting your own perceptions onto um, the wolf. Like we said earlier, the living in so long, um, not just apart from the wolf, but living so long in our own heads about how these species behave that we just create these crazy caricatures um, to the point that we can't even recognize what the actual animal is anymore. Um, and then here's just one example of kind of this kind of celebratory report of this um, young man who had killed a wolf um, in his local area down in, in Alabama. Um, running a little short on time, so I'm going to give you two stories from the African-American culture. These I was very excited about because if you couldn't tell, I'm African-American. Um, <laughs> so I really like this. Um, and a lot of us, unfortunately, have lost a lot of these traditions, um, especially after the Great Migration. A lot of our stories have kind of been lost and a lot of African-Americans have um, extremely high mortality rates and a lot of trauma so that the elders don't really speak of the past at all. Um, and that's also due to respectability politics, basically a lot of pressures that keep us from passing traditions along. So this is a really nice kind of journey of rediscovery for me. So the wolf in African-American folklore is actually a really funny character because he is, <laughs> excuse my language, but he's a little bit of a bumbling idiot. Um, he's always getting into trouble. He is always getting other people into trouble. He's impulsive and he's nosy, but and he's a fool, but understand, he's not stupid. He's foolish. Um, he is, like I said, he's very impulsive and he's always getting into shenanigans, especially with Br'er Fox and Br'er Rabbit. Um, and I'll tell you what Br'er means in just a second. So let's start with this one story. Um, so one day, Br'er Wolf talked Br'er Fox into trying to fool Br'er Rabbit in order to eat Br'er Rabbit. They planned to convince Br'er Rabbit that Br'er Fox had died and that Br'er Rabbit should go and see the body before Br'er Fox was buried. Now, Br'er Fox went along with the plan. So he laid himself out on his bed and he laid real stiff so that Br'er Rabbit would be fooled when he arrived. But Br'er Rabbit was suspicious when he saw Br'er Fox's body and he was wondering why nobody else attended the funeral. So Br'er Rabbit looked upon Br'er Fox's body and then Br'er Fox jumped up real quick, trying to get Br'er Rabbit. But Br'er Rabbit was so fast that he escaped before they knew it. And this is an Uncle Remus tale. Um, Uncle Remus's lesson to take away from this was Br'er Wolf was mighty smart, but the next time you hear from him, he'll be in trouble. Um, because he's always getting into trouble and he's always losing to Br'er Fox because Br'er, or excuse me, Br'er Rabbit, because Br'er Rabbit is always outsmarting him and he's too fast. One more story. It's interesting because the other story um, ended by affirming that Br'er Wolf is really smart, um, but he's just, again, really foolish and he's always getting into trouble. And this story actually begins saying that Br'er Wolf is really smart. He says, now, uh, now a wolf is a very wise man, but he's not so wise as Br'er Rabbit. The rabbit is the most cunning man that go on four legs. In this story, um, and another one that's really similar, Br'er Wolf has a crop or a well that Br'er Rabbit keeps stealing from. And this is another instance where Br'er Br Wolf is kind of victimized by Br'er Br Rabbit a lot. Um, Br'er Rabbit is very rude um, and always trying to uh, take advantage of Br'er Wolf. 
So one night, Bro Wolf sets up a scarecrow because um, he doesn't know yet who's taking, who's stealing from him. And that doesn't work. So he sets up um, a tar baby, um, which is essentially another scarecrow with tar on it. Um, we don't have to get into different conceptions of what that is. Um, Bear Rabbit comes back to steal again, but this time he gets stuck to the tar bay because he's trying to fight it. He kicked the scarecrow before, but this time it doesn't work. He gets stuck to it and he tries to intimidate and he tries to fight it. And then Bear Wolf finds Bear Rabbit stuck to the tar baby the next morning and he sentences him to death. And Bear Rabbit is begging and pleading. He's like, oh, you know, what? You, in order to kill me really swiftly and get your justice, you should throw me into that briar patch. And Br Brer Wolf says, okay, I'll throw you into the briar patch. So he does it. And then Br Rabbit takes off and he's just like, ha ha, I live in the briar patch. Um, so he's not hurt and he escapes. And Br Wolf does not get his justice. So we can see that these stories are packed with a lot of different things. Um, and we're just about to wrap up here. Um, they're packed with ecological observations of landscapes and species composition. Um, but they're also just soaked in notions of self in social dynamics in the antebellum and the reconstruction periods. Um, for example, Br'er Wolf is said to, said to have been arrested before by patty rollers, which was patrollers, um, because uh, areas with a lot of Black people were really heavily policed immediately after um, emancipation. Um, and there's even reflections of spiritual practices um, in these stories. For example, Br'er Rabbit uh, is shown to be using some of the same roots that were used in African-American spiritual traditions that my family actually practiced before the Great Migration, um, such as the use of things like the calamus root. Um, and then, like I said, I would explain what Br'er means. Br'er is brother, uh, but is also brother. Um, and that is extremely significant in terms of kinship titles. Um, Br'er and Ba, they show great respect for the for the fox, the rabbit, the wolf, the bear, terrapin, other uh, animals. Um, and I want to note that I rarely ever meet a Black person, rarely, uh, that doesn't call me sister. And this is why, like, you know, the, the importance of that kinship title is because it's acknowledging the other as a peer, as a sort of relative. Um, so it's not just say, slang or anything like that. Um, and this is a personal note why you should probably think twice before um, adopting that whole vernacular cis, calling people cis. Um, it's not just a piece of slang, it's actually really culturally important. Um, and last note, if you've ever wondered uh, what inspired Disney's Song of the South, or as its uh, current uh, formation is in Splash Mountain, these were the tales. Uh, and they weren't just Uncle Remus tales. These were really widely known uh, African-American folklore. Um, and just as a couple of examples of, again, why these evaluation systems are not absolute, we have two examples here of African-American individuals who ended up killing wolves for one reason or another. And this is um, my last point here, um, which is just kind of looking at where we overlap in all our different viewpoints. Um, where do we share valuations of these different species? And in this case, obviously we're talking about the red wolf and we can talk about the wolf more generally. Where do we share perspectives of these species and how can we kind of leverage those um, in order to communicate better when it comes to conservation efforts for the red wolf, um, when it comes to future reintroduction efforts for the red wolf, um, because we want to be able to engage communities in ways that make sense for them, in ways that are valuable to them, and in ways that are meaningful, meaningful um, and culturally relevant. Um, and in order to communicate with people, you have to have some sort of sense of who they are and what's important to them. Um, and so that's the importance of really studying these different elements of these uh, socio-ecological systems in this element of culture and finding where do we align and where do we diverge and how can we work within those boundaries um, in order to respect different people in the way that they view the red wolf and find ways that we can ensure that the protection and reintroduction of the red wolf is important or is relevant and 
functional to everyone. It honors everybody's cultural significance of the wolf um, and doesn't excessively uh, impose one view of the wolf as just a pest that needs to be lethally managed all the time. Um, and so these are just very few of the, the, the overlaps that um, we can see in the language, um, in these stories and in these reports, in these newspapers. And hopefully we can find more where we positively overlap, overlap in the future in order to better protect the red wolf. So thank you everybody for listening. Thank you for joining me tonight. Um, this was a lot of fun and I hope it was fun for you too. And I'll check for questions. So can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah. Okay, yeah, the, um, the chat was off. So some folks had put some comments in, in the question. Yeah, I'm sorry guys, I should have pointed that out in the beginning. The Q&A uh, box is open. Um, so you can go ahead and put your uh, questions in the Q&A box on the bar below. Sorry, I forgot to mention that at the top, everybody. Okay, let's see. Just reading a question here. Um, I'm going to read your question here, Peggy Clark. I live in the rural Southeast and see a similar cultural bias towards other native carnivore species uh, persist today. The Cherokees have a legend where the rabbit offers to help the bobcat um, hunt a turkey by using his ability to stay motionless until the right moment. This story depicts the bobcat as a natural predator of turkeys and does not villainize his role. Many European American hunters view bobcats in a negative light as competition because they are natural predators of game animals like deer and turkeys. Why do you think these attitudes toward predators continue today, even with abundant population of deer and turkeys? I, you know, that's a great question. And I really like that you shared that story. Um, because I think it's really incredibly important when we talk about um, the way we view these ecological roles, because it's not necessarily a bad thing that another animal um, eats other animals to live. Um, that's what every living being does. Um, and to project moral valuations onto that or moral actions onto that is really silly and very uh, counterproductive. So why do you think these attitudes toward predators continue today? Honestly, because it's cultural. Um, it's deeply, deeply cultural. And I think because so many of us have been removed removed from our cultural histories, we're not able to recognize that anymore. And so we've kind of taken it as fact. Um, like I mentioned earlier, like one of the, a lot of the Bureau of Biological Survey reports very hysterically adopts this line that the wolves are gonna wipe out the deer. Um, that's it's that's just biologically ecologically not um very feasible um but that type of idea still exists um and is very well maybe it's too generous to say it's very right widespread but it persists today um and that's because it's a cult it's embedded in this cultural valuation of humans being the ones that deserve prime um you know we deserve the first pick humans are above everything so we get to decide what happens here what happens there we want livestock we can wipe out the wolf there we want to hunt deer we can wipe out the wolf there that's why i think those types of things still persist um but you know the further we research um the um the more we'll be able to answer that question more specifically thanks for that question how is the population of red wolves at the moment? Are they also in other parts of the country? The red wolf is only in North Carolina on the Alligator River uh, refuge. I believe, uh, Joey, is it 15 that are known to be there? Yeah, there's uh, there's about 10 or 12 with radio collars on. And then there's another like 10 or 15 pups that they haven't captured and radio collared yet. So the estimated population size is approaching 30, but the known confirmed with radio collars is about 10 or 12 um, at the moment. And they inhabit, like like Sunny said, the Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge in Deer County. But some of the animals, there's it's a five-county recovery area. So um, they they inhabit the Alabama Peninsula. 
So there's other animals elsewhere too on that on that peninsula. Yeah. Yep. Thank you, Joey. Um, yeah. So I mean, it's some some say this is a a little bit dramatic of language, but I do believe that this is this is a very uh, critical situation. This uh, you know the red wolf is not. Um, in a great place, even though there has been a lot of progress. I don't want to pretend like there hasn't been progress. Um, you know, they've been protected. They're still here. Let's not pretend like they're not here. Um, but there's just a lot of work to be done. So, you know, full steam ahead. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for your positive comments here. I really appreciate it. This is a really fun one. Um, where can we learn more as a continued topic? This is um, something that we're continuing to work on because, um, you know, going back to the concept of the socioecological system, um, we want to put forth solid recommendations that communities um, and governmental agencies can kind of um, implement into their conservation and future reintroduction efforts. Um, and we want to be able to inform conservation efforts, not just as if, you know, these landscapes are in a vacuum of like, oh, well, you know, if, if the landscape is right, then the wolf will survive, right? Well, no, because people still live there. Um, and uh, so we have to understand those people that are going to be sharing space with the red wolf um, anywhere that they are. So, so and, and the idea, that's where this idea of... Um, you know, stakeholder engagement comes in, even though that's really, uh, forgive my silly language here, but kind of dirty language. Um, uh, you know, you still have to engage with people. And so we want to be able to use this case study that we've done in order to implement that um, into real, like, actionable uh, management recommendations. So you can continue to keep an eye on the Wolf Conservation Center um, lab and um, we'll continue to update all of you, all of our supporters on the work that we're doing on that front. Thank you all very, very much. Um, just looking through, see if I can squeeze one more in here. Um, yeah, that's actually, so, Taimia, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, uh, I'm not sure what that movement is, but um, I am interested in looking more towards uh, African diasporic relationships with, um, uh, with carnivores, because there are a lot of really great examples of people living positively alongside carnivores uh, in, on the African continent. So that would be a really interesting way to go. Sandra, um, I'm not sure um, about that, but I will actually, let me write that down so I can put that on my they radar. Are, they can't see the questions, Sonny. I don't think- Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sandra Gardner asks, are there going to be more question, or excuse me, are there going to be more sessions of Wolf School with Rain Coast Conservation. Um, I actually really did like that. Uh, one of the sessions I saw with them. So I will put that on my radar and um, we'll see what we can do about that. I'm not unaware of plans at the moment. So let's see. Let's do one more question, then we'll get out of here. Ooh, I'm very excited to answer this question. Alvis Steffer Pamela, I hope I pronounced that correctly. I know there's been events for communities in the Red Wolf region on coexistence. Uh, do you know if schools in the region of the Red Wolf have added curriculum to encourage and promote coexistence? Perfect setup. Um, we are really wanting to work more in areas um, throughout the Red Wolf Historic Range. Right now we have our eyes on Galveston and we are really wanting to get in touch with communities um, particularly for youth, but really for everyone to um, co-develop real educational programs um, that highlight things like this, again, to make sure that these things are relevant to the people that we're reaching out to and that we're really being reciprocal, um, sharing knowledge that may have been lost, sharing um, in culture, 
Um, and um, also just on the ecological front, sharing a lot of scientific findings and things um, about the red wolf and its ecology. So we're wanting to do that generally where wolves are, but we are especially looking um, in the areas that have historic populations uh, of the red wolf. Um, okay, well, Thank you, everybody. That was great. Um, really great questions. This was a lot of fun for me. I'm so glad. It looks like you guys had a good time, too. Um, I look forward to doing these in the future. And thank you again. Thank you all for coming. And I hope you all have a great night.